Welcome back to the Fast Life Podcast, which is brought to you by Simpson Motorcycle Helmets. Without a doubt, Simpson has been my go-to helmet since 2016. Their iconic and aggressive style has set them apart from other brands. Simpson offers many different styles of helmets to fit your taste and budget. Head on over to SimpsonMotorcycleHelmets.com to check out all the different options they have for you and give these guys a follow on Instagram at Simpson Motorcycle Helmets. On today's episode, we have Michael from Levitas Moto up there in Portland, Oregon area. Uh, I caught this podcast while I was driving from Washington back down towards California. So sat in his shop, got to see the bike again in person, did a little photo shoot and uh, had a great time talking with him. And yeah, I kind of wish this was a video podcast because, man, it was really cool being by the bike and in his environment where he created it. So anyway, let's get into these uh, sponsors and then we're going to jump right into this episode with Michael from Lobitas Moto. Cowboy Harley Davidson is located in South Austin and they are ready to help you get on the new bike you have been thinking about or help you get your current bike dialed in with all the performance parts and upgrades you need. From service to sales and everything in between, check them out at CowboyHarleyAustin.com and on Instagram at CowboyHarleyAustin. They have new 2023 bikes rolling in daily, so give them a call or head in and let them know that the Fast Life sent you. Our longest running podcast supporter, Lexan Moto, and our Bluetooth headset of choice here at the Fast Life since 2019 is still here providing you with one of the best Bluetooth headsets on the market the G16, which I personally use on my motorcycle rides to check out everything from my favorite playlist to my favorite podcast. The battery life and sound quality is amazing on these headsets. Earlier this year, Lexan dropped the Smart Tire Pump, which became an instant everyday carry for many people on motorcycle trips. Well, now they have refined and taken the pump to new levels with the Lexan Smart Tire Pump Gen 2, which now offers an internal cooling fan is 20% smaller in design and can double as a portable charger while you are away from civilization. Pair these great products with some of the best customer service in the industry and head on over to lexan-moto.com and drop the Fast Life offer code to save yourself 15% off your order. And don't forget to give these guys a follow on Instagram at lexanmoto. If you have seen any of my personal bikes, in person or on the gram over the past six years, you will definitely notice my ongoing support for Lucky Dave's. Their seats have always fit my ass perfectly and had the style profile I prefer in the two-up seat game. I have ran the San Diego bars on my FXR and Dynas for years. Now I currently run the Peacemaker Bar and Riser series on my 2020 Road Glide. These bars are dope with many options to customize the appearance as well as get you dialed at the right height and hand position. I would go as far to say that the Lucky Dave's riser bar is one of the most comfortable bars on the market, no matter what risers you put them in. Check out all the options for your ride at luckydaves.com and give these guys a follow to stay up on product releases and inventory restocks on the gram at Lucky Dave's. Hey guys, you ready to let the dogs out? some people are super soft-spoken in general and so and then they do that and then it's just like fuck man i gotta have a pretty prominent voice i'm the the general foreman at work i run all the all the i'm the head guy at night Mm -hmm. and you know i'm i don't have too many guys younger than me so i got a lot of older guys i gotta gain their respect so (laughs) can't be soft-spoken no no you gotta you gotta be an asshole a lot of times and but for the most part, it's uh, it's been good lately, and guys starting mm-hmm. to respect me now that I got a beard and you know don't have a baby <laughs> face anymore. But you know, yeah, it's it's the Pacific Northwest, man. You got to have a beard up here and some flannel. I got some flannels. You got some flannels. There you yeah. go. Um, I have seen. I have now seen like official hipsters, like in the town that we were in Hood River. Sexuals. No, no, just like the trendy, you oh, know, yeah. flat brim hat kind of. A lot but of those. It's just kind of like, oh, that's cool, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, I don't I don't know what a man is anymore in Portland. <laughs> it's it's crazy. It's crazy? Yeah. How was it whenever all the shit was going down here? So. Was the city on fire for real? Yeah. It yeah. was. Yeah. Like downtown near 
near like the courthouse and stuff like true downtown Portland. It was a shit show. Like I've stayed out of it since yeah. probably for like last five, six years. I used to kind of go out quite a mm-hmm. bit when I was younger in my late twenties, early thirties. But for now, now I'm like, honestly, I got my tools here. I don't want to leave yeah. my house. So if I'm home, like away from work, I want to be here at my shop doing mm-hmm. stuff. Or now that I got kids, I got obligations to be mm-hmm. home a lot, but I don't know. Yeah. I'm kind of a homebody, to be honest. Well, I mean, you got a nice shop here, man. Like, if I had this, I don't even know if I'd go in my house <laughs> straight up. Yeah, there was, I mean, when I was building the Dyna, I was, I mean, I was working at the last, last summer, like probably starting January, I was working 14 and a half hour swing shifts. Mm-hmm. I'd come home around 4.30. I'd work in the shop till about 8.30. Wake, I'd, my wife would wake up. I would have a little breakfast and come back out, work till about two o'clock, then go to work. And I did it for three months. I didn't sleep for three months finishing this bike. Damn. Yeah, I remember that because I remember after the paint came, we wrapped up the paint in December of 21. I think I got the paint back in early, was it early January? Yeah, because I, I, we were traveling a little bit. Yeah, and so it I, sat, like I still had to do, I still had to do the center fill, like mm-hmm. on the dash panel. Um, I had, I still had to redo the swing arm. Mm-hmm. And then... The wiring I completely redid on the bike. I re- actually, the harness that goes to the front of the motor. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the one that dips on the bottom of the bike. Yeah, I actually routed it to the left side. Mm. Um, and then the kickstand idea, actually that happened before I powder coated the frame. So that was that was probably before, yeah, because I, I, I had a powder coat color mm. that I gave you. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, there was just a lot of like the mid controls. That was, you know, it was a tough one. That was yeah. like the last thing. Um, those, uh, those mids are two inches further back than a stock Dyna and mm-hmm. two inches closer in to the bike. Mm. So what, I don't know if you've noticed on a stock Dyna, the right side foot peg is like an inch and a quarter further out from the bike. Mm-hmm. And I think it's to help a person's body weight offset from the primary because mm. the primary is heavy on that side. So they have the right, the right foot further out to kind of counterbalance that. Yeah. Yeah. So I go to the BDL belt drive, which is, I think like inch and a half narrower. Mm-hmm. And that allowed my left foot. To have go you had any the- issues with it? Like as far as, you know, it's like I, I was looking at doing one on, on the chopper. Yeah. The FXR chop. Cause I'm going twin cam in it. Yeah. But I've heard mixed signals. I've heard like Steve from Speed Kings that had a little bit of issues with it. And everybody that I've talked to has had issues, including like uh, Lucas um, uh, Joker. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen him. He's like a BRL racer guy. Uh, And then the Alloy Art race bike, um, they had issues just with the clutch pretty much. Mm. Um, The alignment installing, it's a breeze, uh, but the clutch is the hard part. So I've actually, this, this thing's slipping pretty bad, but like it's, every other ride it's slipping and mm-hmm. then when it gets warm it starts slipping but um barnett offers like a a drop-in clutch pack for it that apparently resolves it mm. so yeah i just didn't want to go that route if it was going to be because I'm, I'm doing the chop for distance you know what i mean yeah to you know the the ride to you know durango where we're kicking off that whole tour is going to be a big loop from to south texas and then up through new mexico to there yeah so it'll probably be like a 1500 mile there and then it's a thousand mile ride if back. If you want to ride it and not fuck around, like just deal keep, with shit, just keep the stock chain. Yeah, I'm probably going to do it. that. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, the motor is out of a 14. Okay. Um, The whole the whole thing's out of a 14 bagger. Yeah. So, but I am doing carburetor. I just, I like having a carburetor in my life. You, you thought about I mean? like Electron? No, because I've heard lots of people have problems with elect- Electrons. I think, I mean, I run Electron on that CR250 behind you. Mm-hmm. And it is the sweetest thing ever. Like, For real? Yeah, because I, you know, I haven't really dealt with dirt bikes a ton until I got this thing, and then jetting that thing and all the elevation changes that I mm-hmm. ride in, it was a pain in the ass. So I got Electron. I don't, you, you know, I set the idle, and that's it. Yeah, um, I don't know. I've 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 got this very good relationship with Makuni, as a, not the brand, but just the the carburetors. Like yeah. I I know them pretty well, and uh, I understand them fairly uh yeah i mean like that that evo that fxr that thing it sat for six years we uh the gas is hitting it and we had to put a starter in it mm. and the thing fired up and it runs amazing and we've never touched the carb yeah yeah and carbs are cheap man like you get a brand new Makuni 42 for you know 
fuck 300 bucks and then i don't know i was like i just it's such a cheap thing to it's so important for the bike so i just look at it as like i'll just buy a new carburetor and yeah go that route and you know of course you have to make some shit work so that uh, it'll fit up to the uh twin you know for that twin cam situation but i don't know i'm not even thinking about that right now i'm just right now is about to be fab work but for over 50 years the nest family has provided us with top quality custom motorcycle parts and today's product line is better than ever offering you products to enhance your motorcycles performance and the overall look of your bike with 12 different categories of custom air cleaners arlen ness has a filter that will fit your budget and or your taste i'm currently running the method air cleaner on my 20 road glide along with their one-of-a-kind method no flex front fork legs and bagger fork guards which allow me to show off my arlen ness gold fork tubes it's really sick from custom handlebars and rims to bodywork and foot controls head on over to arlenness.com to start getting the parts you need to enhance your motorcycle experience and as an added bonus to Ness's well-stocked product line, you can use offer code in all caps, FASTLIFE10, to save yourself 10% on your purchases. And it's always free shipping on orders over 100 bucks. And lastly, give these guys a follow on the gram at Arlen Ness Motorcycles. On your build, um, you know, where did this whole idea, this crazy concept of, you know, because I, I, I was telling people, and you might have heard it on the podcast before that you were building probably the most unique Dyna ever, yeah. in my opinion, with all the things that you did to it, um, which we'll get into in this podcast. But why, you know, you buy a 2017 Lowrider S and then that's really nice. That's you know, really nice. Bought it so with 300 miles on it, like pristine. And then you're an electrician by trade. Yep. So where does all this fab work come into play? So like, I, uh, when I was 12, I started working with my stepdad as a mm. carpenter. My okay. stepdad, you know, restored old historical homes around Portland. You know, a lot of like tedious handwork. Yeah. So when I was young, it was like, you know, bringing lumber into the job, sweeping up, stuff like that. But I was around some really talented carpenters building like custom profile trimmed, uh, trims for houses, uh, doing a lot of just tedious work. So mm. I, I gained, a, I guess, a pretty good eye for detail. Mm. And so I, I kind of consider myself like kind of an angle grinder fabricator. Okay. Like I, I'm really good at taking measurements. Mm. I, I'm really good at like seeing the process through and I can get do, I can get by with like limited tools. Like I don't have the fanciest shit here. Mm -hmm. Like I've got a nice TIG welder. I have a shitty ass bandsaw. Um, you know, I've got some woodworking tools that I use for metal, but mm -hmm. like I can get a really good product out of it. How are those Everlast? I'm thinking, I want to get back They're into the it. They're the shit. They so are. that MIG is is new to me. My buddy bought that and he upgraded to something else. But my 255 EXT with a water cooler, like I'm probably in that thing like $3,500. Like it's not a cheap setup, but yeah. it is, uh, it's more, more of a welder than I'll ever need. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you can like, this is my first titanium project on this pipe. Yeah. And like I, you scroll through Instagram and like, I've seen a lot of guys that can't weld as good as what I did on my first try. Yeah. So again, it's just like going back to the woodwork, you know, getting yeah. an eye for detail, having a steady hand. But, um, I don't know. I, I'd like to get better, you know, mm -hmm. like my machinist and speed dealer, like a lot of those guys that are like into the programming machining, like mm -hmm. those guys are dialed. Yeah. But what I appreciate is I appreciate the guys that, don't have the fancy tools and mm -hmm. only have like, you know, a basic, uh, you know, single car garage. So you look at Jacob Kennard, like granted he's got access to a ton of stuff, but he's building yeah in his garage, sick ass bikes. That's how main garage. drive is. Corey, Corey yeah. from main drive cycles is like that. And you know, and he's actually the one that's going to be doing the fab work on my bike. So I'm actually looking forward to the process of being close to it. As far as like, I'm hoping that I, this whole build, I come out of it a proficient welder. You know what I mean? I know how to TIG. Yeah. But I don't know. When I say I know how to TIG, it's like saying I know how to tattoo, but I don't know how to set everything up. Yeah. You know, like you, a tattoo machine, you just, you know, step on the pedal and it goes. Yep. Right? Same thing with the... with the. So I know. didn't I didn't know how to do anything with the TIG. I So my dad, um, 
got a TIG when he was building the car behind us, his Volkswagen Corrado. Mm-hmm. And that thing was stock. And then he got into the turbo thing. Yeah. And at one point, this is, you know, until the last time I drove it and blew it up, that thing was, you know, that would eat up an R6 on the highway. For real? Yeah. I mean, you could turn that thing up and make it 700 plus horse. Damn. So, but we did all the fabrication on it and we mm-hmm. got a TIG. It was an Everlast, a little bit lower model than that, but it was, you know, this was kind of before there was tons of YouTube content on welding. Mm-hmm. So I would mess around with it. Just, you know, basically start an arc and, you know, yeah. kind of, you know, I thought I could just make puddles here. I didn't know mm-hmm. penetration. I didn't know. Heat. Yeah, exactly. I didn't know um, gas coverage, which is a huge thing when it comes to like motorcycle stuff. People want to see colors, but mm-hmm really that's not what you want you want no color Mm -hmm. on your welds so but with this thing youtube has been a huge a huge help like i've never had a a pro welder sit down and show me things so um trial and error trial and error a lot of it is that and then with the tig like doing stainless steel which i've done a lot of exhaust um some guys they'll do a pulse which kind of creates like a a nice rhythm in the arc which Mm -hmm. you can have a really consistent bead. I like straight DC current. Mm. So you just use your pedal. And um, again, it puts like the actual craft into the welding. If you, yeah. And so you can like set it up. Stuff, I never liked that either. Yeah. It kind of just, you maintain your arc distance and, and then it just does it. You know, yep. I like to do everything myself. Yeah. I know so, what you mean. Like, uh, you know, I had to sell my welding setup to play for a fucking wreck car once, but and I just haven't had space or, you know, I got into heavily into photography afterwards. And then that turned into, uh, you know, such a passion project that it was like, well, if I go by a welder, the amount of time I need to spend practicing and learning how to do all this stuff and the money I need to spend to also get another bandsaw and get another yeah. purge system and all this other stuff. It's like, man, I just don't know if I really want to go down that path. I don't, I didn't, I don't necessarily want to be a fabricator for people for hire. Yeah. Right. But, you know, during this building process, it's like the world looks at paint as if it's not like anybody could do it, which technically anybody can, but anybody could strike an arc too. Yeah. Right. So, but in the world of motorcycling, they don't look at paint. It's just not looked at as the same skill set as a fabricator is. Yeah. I, I uh, I like to do as much as I can by myself, but my problem is if you look around this place, I've got, I could build anything like mm-hmm. whether it be a house, plumbing projects, electrical, like mm-hmm. motorcycles, um, cars. Yeah. I have got my hands in every single pot, it seems like, and <laughs> I haven't gone super deep on any which yeah. avenue. And that's kind of a downfall of mine, but I, you know, some people say you can be a, you know, a master of one or none at yeah. all. And I haven't really- Jack of all trades, I, master of none. Yeah, I haven't really gone down one avenue that I'm gonna stick with because I, well, I think that you're the way that you just are inherently like some people are detail oriented and some people are not. Yeah. Right. And then, so I think that that trait alone just, uh, exudes like the kind of bikes that you build, you know what I mean? And the kind of other projects that you have. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like a, some people are born with it. Some people have yeah. to acquire it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean like everything that I've done. And I'd say the last 10 years when it comes to like cars and bikes, they've been very clean. Mm -hmm. I like, I like an OEM look, but put a little twist on it. Granted this, the paint job in the Dyna is pretty radical, but I think we went pretty subtle with like, it's going to be timeless. I think so too. I mean, it's definitely one of the paint jobs that I've done that uh, has gotten the most like requested. Like I want something in this family. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and I'm just glad that you did all carbon instead of like, well, I got a fender and a dash, but everything else is, you know, it's like you did yeah. it all right. You got you know it. I mean, it wasn't cheap. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, and then the, the tank was a struggle. Yeah. And I'm sure you've had a lot of time in that, but, um, I mean like that, the only thing like the dash and the side covers, I didn't modify, but that rear fender, I took yeah. two and a half inches off of it. You, you wouldn't know. Yep. Um, the front fender that's, you know, that's, uh, DTF performance made for a mid glide, you know, yeah. for a bagger. I had to cut the hell out of that thing. And then re epoxy it and all that shit, right? I, I didn't have, I just trimmed it. It was trimmed. a trim, okay. but I reprofiled the shape. Like you look at it, you'd think it would be made for the bike. Mm. But there was like, you know, 
tons of hours. I, I, you know, I wasn't even thinking that it was meant for a mid glide front end. Yeah. And then I put it on, you know, or sorry, a wide glide, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Bagger. Uh, wide, wide, wide glides. mid. Yeah. It's, yeah, uh, it's, it's probably in the wide glide family okay. if you would, you know, so, cause it runs a wider front wheel and all but that. Yeah. I, that thing shows up at the last second, you know, before it was like two weeks before born free. And I was like, I, it showed up and I pulled it out of the box, held it up. And I'm like, Oh fuck, mm. this ain't a bolt on. Like <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think I was going to be able to salvage it. And then all of a sudden it was like hours staring at it, holding it up. I'm like, okay, where can I trim? How can I support it? So it ended up working out. Worked but, out yeah. What about, uh, you know, so like I said, we were, you're, you're coming into this and these different jobs afforded you, you know, to start kind of getting your tools set up and, you know, you get this bike. It was, I mean, there's dirt bikes in here. Has that always been something? No, no. I, so I, you know, I didn't grow up poor. Yeah. My parents, uh, you know, we had a, a decent house. My parents had a okay job. We had a roof over our head. We had food on the table, mm -hmm. but I never really had, you know, the ability to like pursue motorcycles, which my dad had dirt bikes when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, all of my childhood pictures are me sitting on my dad's three wheeler with him and, you know, dirt bike or dirt rider magazines around the house all the time as a kid. Yeah. And I, you know, I would have the same, you know, like December issue of dirt rider where they had the new models. And I was like, I want a CR 80 so yeah. bad. And I, I never had the opportunity to get a motorcycle till I was, um, about 19. Um, in high school, my dad bought a SV 650 after my parents divorced and I rode that a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, no endorsement, you know, no training, just, yeah, just get after just it, put a lot of miles on it. And then I went from that to a 2005 Yamaha R1. And that was what opened up the motorcycle world for me. Yeah. And that was, that was way too much bike for me, but well, you're Oh five or Oh five. 05. So that was yeah. the 20 valve version. Oh yeah. I remember when they started came out with that. I was always a Jixer guy. Suzuki. Yeah, the, but. the R1, um, you see that that black helmet up there. Yeah. So I hit a car at 90 miles an hour and Ooh. slid 260 feet face first, lost 20% of the skin on my body, almost died. Uh -huh. Almost had my right hand amputated. Um, I was, I was crazy. You yeah. Know? You know, 120 mile an hour freeway wheelies. Like it was, yeah, I was a young kid on a fast bike. Like it was, it got me into some trouble with the law, but, uh, you know, after the, after the wreck, I kind of, settled down and then mm -hmm. um got into the electrical career and that took a little while before i was making money for extra you know, you know hobbies stuff. and stuff and then once i got my journeyman license i excelled beyond that pretty quick and then the money started flowing and i was like fuck mm -hmm. i want these toys i'm gonna get them <laughs> so yeah i mean all these di dirt bikes yours yeah everything's mine except uh the fxr and obviously that old that dyna frame is a, a buddies of mine yeah that what is that that's a bat that aprilia so that's not a dirt bike that's a street that's a factory supermoto that is that thing's badass looking yeah they're uh that was actually have you heard of the one moto show yeah so uh, three years ago that was the only supermoto they picked for it nice so that was in the show um that was a pretty crazy build build if you will it's <laughs> bolt-on parts i made a couple stuff for it um it was all about getting it lightweight. So that's yeah. 260 pounds. It's close to 90 horse. Damn. So that fucking ribs. It is, is absolute scariest motorcycle I've ever ridden in my life. Uh, <laughs> fifth, fifth gear power wheelies with like quarter throttle. It's nuts. So is that, is that's kind of like a, it's a 550 V twin. That's what I was going to ask if it was a V twin or yeah. a four, like a inline four or something like that. Yeah. So that, a little too narrow for an inline, but yeah, it's, um, so Aprilia, they started doing supermoto racing mm -hmm. um, back in like Europe or whatever. And for them to compete in this class, they had to make a production bike. Yeah, so they yeah. took the race bike, they put lights and turn signals on it and they sold it to the public. And like the service manual or, you know, the maintenance intervals were not miles, they were hours. For real? Yes. Damn. So a typical owner that rides these things quite a bit, they change the oil every 200 miles. Mm. That's, that's, that's quite a bit. Yeah. But so like every, every other ride, mm -hmm. every third ride, maybe. Damn. So that's uh, a, that's a lot of maintenance for, for motorcycling. But <laughs> unfortunately that's going to get parted out pretty soon. It is. Yeah. The, the crankshafts, 
are obsolete now. You can't get cylinders. Mm-hmm. Parts are completely gone. What um, year is it? That's a 2007. That's the Damn. first year that they sold that bike. So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty wild looking. Mm-hmm. Like the colors are pretty bright. I wanted, it's kind of the supermoto thing. Yeah. Um, I did the graphics on my CR250, like the exact same, but um, that thing gets rid- ridden pretty hard. But the Aprilia, that was like my first really big build. Yeah. If you want to call it a build, you know, stripped it down, did a lot of stuff, but, mm-hmm. and then I had the Harley at the time and then it just opened up a big door for, would you say that like some of the Harley stuff, whenever the whole racing thing came around, it kind of, that was, like, that was kind of an inspiration. More. Yeah. And I think the, the biggest reason why I even decided to do what I did is, um, you know, I used to, used to ride at the track with the R1. Mm-hmm. And then after I recovered from that wreck, I got a Aprilia RC4 factory, which is an amazing track bike, but yeah. it was not a great street bike. So I was into speed corners and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And, um, we'll circle back to why I even got a Harley a little bit later, but yeah. so fast forward, I have the Harley and I'm trying to ride it like a sport bike and I'm finding the limitations of lean angle and mm-hmm. the weight and the wobble was horrible. Yeah. And, uh, it was actually, I got home from a ride around Hag Lake, which is a lake with some twisted roads around it about 20 miles away from here. And mm-hmm. it was my little racetrack where I wouldn't get harassed <laughs> by the cops. And I came home one day and my buddy met me over here on his Dyna. I'm like, dude, I gotta, I gotta fix this wobble. Like, yeah. It's horrible. And then I was looking like, how can I, I understood the problem of why the, yeah. the rear wheels moving with the, you the know, motor. swing arm attached to the you know, rubber mounted motor and trans. I'm like, why don't I just isolate it like any other bike? Mm-hmm. And then it just turned into this. <laughs> so that was the first idea. Yeah. It was on over, the build. it was over like, I don't know, four Coors lights and talking to my buddy <laughs> and we're like, what if we did this? And yeah, that's not a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you reached out and started telling me what you were doing and you know, the, the spy photos I was getting from you throughout, throughout the build, it was just like, I was, like I just asked you a while ago, I was genuinely interested, did, you know, running that, you know, isolating that swing arm to the frame, did that actually help? Did it make, did it solve the problem? It, it, it so you know. the only thing I can say is it reminds me a lot of like a, a naked sport bike. Okay. It does not ride like a Harley anymore, especially with the front end done the way I did it. Yeah. Um, it does like it's, there's no Harley to it except for the sound and the engine. It, mm. it is a sport bike but yeah. it still looks like a Dyna. And yeah. that's what I yeah. wanted. I didn't want it to not look like a Dyna. Okay. That makes sense. Cause I mean, you basically, you know, built like almost like a Moto GP esque Dyna. Yeah. You know what I mean? With the, the weight savings, the power, the titanium and, you know, use a lot of like more Euro styling products. You know what I mean? Like the Brembo master cylinders and all those type of things. It just has like that Euro vibe to it. You know what I'm yeah. saying? But yeah, it fucking it rips, dude. I mean, sounded mean as hell while ago. Yeah, almost not streetable. <laughs> it, but it's pretty loud. Like, yeah, you know, my ears ring really bad after riding it. Yeah, but it's that's the point. You know, you yeah. want it loud and obnoxious, and look at it kind of adds to the feel of the bike. So what? So what was the what was the draw to the Harley? Um, I actually had a friend that, you know was interested in looking at a sportster i'm like mm-hmm. why would you want a sportster like those those are girl bikes yeah they're little and i'm like all right let's go to let's go to the dealership down the way mm-hmm. and pull up and right as i pulled my truck in there was two fx dls's mm-hmm. one of them had a 117 in it and i'd never seen a club style you yeah. know t-sport style fairing on a dyna let alone a dyna that i even liked mm-hmm. and pull up parked next to these two bikes i was like those are actually kind of cool. Kind of like the, you know, the brown retro mag looking wheel. Yeah. And then get looking at the sports stores. I'm bored as hell in about two minutes. And then, um, the dealership had a FX DLS for sale. Mm-hmm. And I was like, shoot, I could maybe see myself ride one of these. Yeah. And then a couple months later I was working and I had some downtime. I was looking on like cycle trader or whatever. And then I found this bike for sale in Michigan Mm-hmm. And it was, I guess it was probably February or so. Yeah. I want to say in 2018. And um, 
the guy had it posted for sale. It, he'd ridden it twice at 340 miles on it. Mm-hmm. He had recent divorced guy, midlife crisis buys, you know, the baddest Dyna out yeah. there, I guess what you could buy and, um, scared himself mm-hmm. after a couple of rides. <laughs> and so it's, meanwhile, it's, you know, winter time in Michigan, he's got it posted for, I think 19 and a half thousand. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, emailed him, got his phone number and I called him up like, Hey dude, like interested in your bike problem is I'm in Oregon. Um, I'm going to give you five seconds to answer this, but, um, basically I offered him like, Hey, will you take 15,800? I'll wire it to you in five minutes. And he's like, okay. (laughs) So I got the bike pretty cheap, virtually brand new warning stickers still on it. Everything shipped it out here. Um, went and picked it up at this like little, um, freight little warehouse thing. Yeah. I didn't know how to start it. I never ridden a Harley. Yeah. It, they give me the fob. I'm like, what's this? Where's the actual key for the yeah. ignition? And, um, the only thing the guy had done is the flush mount cap mm-hmm. and fuel, fuel cap and gauge. And the thing was out of gas. Mm. So I get it started. I ride to the gas station. I couldn't figure out how to pop the fucking gas cap off. <laughs> so I called the dude. I'm like, dude, how do I get the gas caps up? and showed me like told me how to do it and then after that it was just a downward spiral into the harley world for real yeah so what were some of the early uh inspiration what what year was this 18 you said 18 yeah early 18 i bought the bike so what were some of those uh those things that started to catch your eye because 18 is i have been saying it for years now one of the first upgrades that pay off for the longevity of your motorcycle ownership is a thunder max efi module For those that don't know what that does for your riding experience, basically the T-Max module provides your Harley-Davidson with proprietary auto-tune technology. It has a barometric sensor and a wideband O2 sensors, which constantly read the ambient air and air-fuel ratio to optimize the performance output from your fuel-injected engine. You can order these modules with pre-downloaded base map for your current stage of performance, or have the bike brought to a dyno tuner for a custom map. I can tell you from experience, I've watched my bike on the dyno learn from every dyno pool in real time. It works and I have been running these modules on my bikes since 2015. The team at Thunder Max are some of the best in the business and you can catch them supporting the big events like Sturgis all the way down to things like our camp out. Thunder Max is in the streets with you. Head on over to thunder-max.com and get yourself dialed in with a T-Max tuner and drop the Fast Life offer code at checkout and save yourself 10% on your purchase. And follow my guys on the gram at ThunderMax EFI. Shit, it's probably, you know, two years before the bagger racing thing really kicked off. Yep. Um, 18 but you know club style and performance bikes i mean i I guess in in 18 when i got the bike um i think the trendy thing that wasn't quite mainstream was like the really tall rear shock yeah so like that fender gap at first i hated i thought it was atrocious i was like why would you want to make a dirt bike out of a street bike Uh like you're not going to have that much ground like that much articulation in your suspension like what's going on um so i hated that and then, of course, I've always appreciated fabrication, and I liked welding and stuff like that. So I seen the royalty pipe on a Dyna. It's like yeah. that is the best exhaust, hands down, hands down. So I bought one for the bike. Um, Just glad you actually got it. Yeah, it took a <laughs> long time. A lot of emails to Patrick, yeah. and I actually know him personally now, and yeah. he's a cool dude. I, I uh, think his think he could benefit from maybe some better business practice but the yeah. guy is an insane talented guy really yeah. nice and humble too he moved up to dallas he lives not too far from us but yeah he's, i think he's he kind of he's not trying to be in this stuff anymore no you know no i i follow his personal page and um you know spent a like good amount of time with him at the one show when he yeah. brought his turbo dyna but um cool dude at the time he was just you know building the bike Mm-hmm. how I thought was cool back then, but now it's evolved. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. When that, you know, that was definitely my favorite pipe that ever came out and it still to this day has the, that, that vibe that I like. I like the, the Moto GP. I like all that kind of more handmade looking stuff that, mm-hmm. that, that just looks cool. It looks like badass. Like I used to love, 
like when I rode sport bikes, I used to love like the uh, the like Yoshimura, the way those you know the the tie force, like all these badass pipe companies and stuff. Ultimately, end up landing into the Brock's family of things. But yeah. you know, at the same time, it's a uh, I just like unique exhaust systems, and I feel that one's always looked unique, especially when you have Harley eyes. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you're used to Vance and Hines short shots and big radius duels. And, yeah, you know, and then of course like. You know, that's one of the things that we, you know, we've been talking with other exhaust companies. It's like, you know, if you look at pipes from like 2016, 2017, 2018, almost everybody was just essentially a cone engineering, yeah. you know, cone shaped thing. And now even the performance looking exhaust systems have kind of evolved where most brands, even like Bassani and stuff have like their own unique look to, you know, uh, their turnouts, all these different things. So, yeah. you know, now it's like, you can't really you know, just have a fucking cone on the back of your yeah. exhaust. And, and that's, that's what um, really got me into the Harley world is exhaust. Cause I had the TIG welder. Um, I, the first pipe I did was actually for my Dyna mm -hmm. and I, uh, I sold off my royalty pipe to my cousin's friend up in Alaska. And I knew that I was kind of going, kind of go down the rabbit hole of building stuff for the bike. So I, I decided to buy some straight stainless and i made my own pie cuts and I built a pie cut exhaust for this bike. Mm -hmm. Did a, a cone with a, a, you know, a turnout just like the royalty. Um, it looked like shit. My <laughs> welds were super cold. Um, fit up wasn't great, but that single exhaust got me so much experience in fabrication and welding that like a couple months later, I built a, uh, a pipe for a, um, a soft tail low rider S mm. with the 114. Um, still to this day, I've never seen a 114 make the power that that pipe made. For real? Yeah, it made 130 horse, 134 foot pounds of torque at the tire. Damn. With a 114 and an S and S 475 cam. That's a shit ton. Yeah. So, and it's it's due to some reading and a lot of, um, not necessarily experimentation, but a lot of just trying to understand exhaust systems. Yeah. And, um, so I did some kind of things that still to this day, not too many people do is like the bigger inch motors. You, I go to a, a, a two inch primary. Uh -huh. Um, you see a lot of guys do this stepped header designs and it just, the actual logic of it doesn't make sense how they, they do a hard step. It's going to cause turbulence in the, exhaust flow so i do a, a smooth transition right next to the head mm -hmm. um straight to two inch and run two inch all the way down but um that pipe i did like a weird two-stage baffle muffler it kind of opened up mm -hmm. and i don't know what what that pipe did but that pipe that bike was i mean <laughs> it made some jam damn yeah that's wild i would i would definitely you know that's kind of like the horsepower range I like to be at. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just naturally, my 131, you know, exhaust, uh, Thunder Max, I'm riding that 130, 135 yeah. range. Uh, pretty comfortable with that. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, I'm, I'm, I got an ST on order, low rider. I'm hoping that just a cam exhaust and all that stuff can put me in that range. Yeah. 124-ish, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I 120 horse is very doable with that. Yeah. And it's a lighter bike, so yeah. it'll 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 still feel the same, you know yeah. what I mean? But yeah, that's cool, man. I, that's one of the things I do plan on doing. Like, I'm hoping that throughout this build process, that that I can acquire more knowledge within welding. I am going to buy another one. I don't know if I'm going to really. I don't really want to go super deep into buying another bandsaw and all that shit again. So I'm yeah. probably just going to go with like. Uh, you know, they have those companies that sell like all the pie cuts already cut. Yeah. So I I did. Tycon industry. Tycon, that's I, right. I bought, I bought all pie cuts for the titanium exhaust. It's just cutting titanium is a little tricky. Yeah. And it just, it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So making pie cuts, it's not hard. You can do it on a chop saw. You can do it with an angle grinder, but mm -hmm. it's to buy a bag of completely clean D bird shit ready to weld. is kind of yeah. nice. Yeah. And that's pretty much the route I want to go. And I know I'll, I'll spend up quite a bit of money, but it's something that I want to like own. You know what yeah. I mean? I want to own the experience of knowing that I, actually welded something together on this bike yeah you know what i mean and uh my biggest suggestion mm -hmm. if you are to get into welding is to get a good table yeah this one right here is texas metalworks mm -hmm. i forget what city it's out of but 
my wife bought this for me for Christmas a couple of years ago. And for it's, real? this is the, almost the, you know, the same investment you should be making in your welders, a nice for flat real? table. Nice. Yeah. I'm definitely going to have to be something cause I'd like to, you know, even, even if I only used, you know, the welding situ- situation just to make my own exhaust systems for my bikes, I, I kind of like the idea of that. Yeah. And you know, if I got good at it, I wouldn't mind doing one for people here and there, but I don't want to go full. You don't want to, yeah. Ham into like, all right, I got four exhausts on order because then I'm back in the boat of, you know, not enough time. And I, you know, I was thinking I was going to get into that route. And then I, you know, found myself, I'm like, okay, you know, I've done five, six exhausts for customers. Yeah. And um, you spend so much time on it, you factor in your hourly wage. And I'm like, yeah. okay, why didn't I just work a, you know, an extra half day at work. And, you know, what was the point of that? But it's just, it's, you gain the experience and knowledge yeah. and, but I, I simply do not have the time or need the money yeah. to make $350 profit on exhaust. I just don't need it. Yeah. I'd rather do something else. But and then if it breaks the warranting, all yeah, this shit. Just, yeah. I know I've had, you know, brackets break on guys and oh, I'll fix it for you. Charge. I don't give a shit. Like just, I want. Yeah. It's one pe- thing. People think that like, you know, like that's a, that's a common issue amongst every exhaust company, right? Yeah. Brackets breaking. That's not necessarily, you know, some people just go super crazy and make these crazy, you know, systems, but they, they can like a, like bracketry for it and, you know, but yeah, that's part of motorcycling, man. Brackets breaking on yep. exhaust like, systems. Like, you know, I, I think a lot of people have issues with like the thunder header. Yeah. Uh, I've heard a lot of people breaking those. The royalty brackets break like crazy. I've, made new brackets for guys with the pipes um, just because I have a template of it because, you know, I yeah. had one and it cracked and so I just made my own. So I make made a template and I've make them for people here and there. Yeah. Um, but I've, you know, the, I, my, my first bracket on my titanium pipe broke. For real? Yeah. And it was a titanium bracket <laughs> and it just, it wasn't quite beefy enough. So I made a steel one and it's been fine since. But mm. Yeah, it's part of it, man. Yeah. So. But yeah, I got some ideas. Um, the FXR, it's depending on, I don't know if I'm going to go a tracker style exhaust or your traditional two into one look, you know, yet. So I'm, that's going to be like the literal last thing that gets built on the bike. Yeah. I think, you know. So there's a kind of an avenue I want to try, not necessarily on my Dyna, but another bike is um, Z pipe technology. Have you heard of like an mm-hmm. H pipe, X pipe on a hot rod? X pipes on, you know, they put it underneath the rig, like yeah. kind of balance out the, you know, the banks basically on a V type engine. Yeah. Kind of balances it out. Well, there's a guy in Dubai who's created this Z pipe technology and he's doing it on like hyper cars mm. and he's done them on V eights and like, you know, Euro cars and it transformed the, the sound for like real? insane. And so basically you would split the primary into two. Mm hmm. And then you take one of each of them and make it basically a, a two into two, but they're going to cross. Mm. And it, um, I'd love to try it on a Harley. The packaging is going to be interesting. Yeah. And it might kind of be a little cluttered, but it, it would be really cool. So it, because of that, it changes the sound system. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, it'd be interesting. Yeah. You know what I mean? If it makes power, that'd be awesome too. Yeah. I mean, it'd be, it'd be worth a shot. Yeah. It'd be cool. Yeah, that's probably a hard thing. It's like you want to make like me. I'm I'm like, you know, probably seventy percent looks, thirty percent performance for me. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because I'm just a visual person. I mean, because I feel like most exhaust systems are going to give give you a little something, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, sometimes the the best exhaust system is just the ugliest, and I'm not really, you know, I just can't. I don't care about five horsepower that bad. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah, that um, royalty pipe. It did not make good power. Yeah, that's that's what I heard. It sounded on that. pretty good until I started, you know, actually hearing better sounding exhausts. Yeah, um, the Royal T pipe did not come with any muffler packing. Mm. I think a lot of these pipes out there they don't come with packing. Mm. They sound really tinny. Yeah, I know what you mean by that. Yeah, yeah, that, that shit. That, I don't know. I like a little bit of like just deep. Yeah, you so know. I have a company in New York that makes me my packing. Mm-hmm. and they actually make packing for like race teams around mm-hmm. the world and they they kind of developed a it's a packing material that they had but they packaged and sewed it into a padding that 
was going to work for motorcycles and it was kind of like a one-off deal and i've bought a lot so i could build 20 30 exhaust of it yeah but it is super deep for real yeah it i mean the titanium on this kind of accentuates the sound and it kind of resonates because it's so thin wall and light but mm -hmm. it does have a pretty deep bark for for what it is nice well yeah that'd be cool to see like more technology coming into the harley world because kind of like as a reference to your bike you've kind of done that like you've kind of went that direction of instead of looking within the confines of the catalog. current industry yeah. you know, the catalog yeah you started looking other places to kind of bring stuff in to give a fresh take and a fresh look you know what i mean so even outside of the motorcycle industry as a whole like you were saying with you know the packing and things like that from you know race car technology and shit yeah so that's, that's that's exactly i mean that's this bike too the T it's every little part, you know, I was like, can I design it better than what I can buy? Or is it worth trying to make it yeah. or should I just buy it? So like, there's a, quite a few, you know, parts that you can buy on this thing. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of them got modified too, but, uh, you know, some stuff it's just, you got to outweigh your options. Is it worth the time and energy to try to yeah. make it? Or can you just settle with something that's good enough? Yeah. That's always going to be an issue. So, you know, you get back into this, you know, you're building this bike and you start with that exhaust. This is exhaust. The first thing that kind of like was the, 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 the banana pill that made you slip all the yep, way down this hill. Yep. So I think the first thing, um, first thing I did is I bought a set of Olin's shocks for it. Mm -hmm. Um, I immediately regretted it cause I didn't know you could order the black line with the, what are they? They had this old, the gold reservoir Yeah. with the black line shock. I didn't know you could buy that. Yeah. So I was, I seen a couple of pictures of them. And so I bought the standard, you know, silver body, black yeah. spring, gold reservoir. And I was like, okay, now I got to strip it apart, anodize it, powder coat, and then come to find out shit, you can buy it. <laughs> I was like, fuck. Okay. And so it was kind of winter time. And then I was like, all right, let's try to build an exhaust. Yeah. That didn't work out. And then I started doing customer exhausts and other projects and home remodels and stuff. And then put the bike back together and started riding it and rode it a couple times pretty hard. And that's when I'm like, this bike sucks. <laughs> hate the way it rides. It's super loose. Yeah. It's no sport bike, you know, front end's really sluggish. The rear end fucking floats all around. Yeah. It's slow in my opinion. So this is 19 now, 2019. -ish? Probably 19, 20. Yeah, yeah. Probably I would say like, what was it? It was probably like summer of 20 is when I never really cut into it. For real. Yeah. Yeah, I figured it probably would have been that because I remember you reaching out the beginning of 21, right? Yeah, it was probably early 21. Yeah, because we were waiting on the tank for like four or five mm -hmm. months, remember? Maybe more than that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right, because you were the, the, the paint was supposed to show up in March. Yeah. And then it got... Then it was May. And then it was June. I think it actually... I don't think I got you my tank till October. Uh, yeah, I think it was something like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But that was 21 and we wrapped it up, you know, had it back to you in 22. And uh, so, yeah, so, you know, the, the exhaust, you know, run me through this. Like, what was it? Just run through the whole. The, so it started out with, you know, the, the crazy idea to make the swing arm pivot through the frame. Yeah. Um, I kind of, you know, was looking at everything. Can I package this? Okay. What am I going to do about the swing arm? Yeah. So I get get to the point where I've got my frame stripped on this table. My buddy that was here earlier, he grabbed his phone out and he's like, started recording as I built this makeshift, um, tubing notcher uh -huh. to notch the frame. And he's like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, this is a nice bike. I'm like, fuck it. <laughs> and so through the frame, I went, um, I went to my dad's house. I didn't have a lathe at the time and turned up the tube for the pivot. Mm hmm tacked it in, you know, made sure it was perfectly square level the whole nine. And, uh, from that point on, it was no turning back. Yeah. And then shortly after that, I'm like, you know what? These struts, they're ugly. Yeah. And so, and you kind of needed to make something anyway to kind of pull it back some, right. With the, uh, with the wheel being a little bit further back now or what? It is, it is the same spot at stock. It is. It yeah. is. Nice. So we'll touch on that right now. So track dynamics went to them. I saw they came out with the FXR racer swing arm. Mm -hmm. and so that's actually an FXR side. Okay. So he built the swing arm. I told him my pivot point was going to be further back. The FXR swing arm length 
was a little bit closer to what I needed. Yeah. So we started with the sides. Um, and then I told him like, Hey, the, the cross piece, it can be pretty far forward since the yeah. pivot is really close to the frame. Well, he kind of missed that. And then he kind of missed the shock mounts where they needed to be. Cause he was like, he was probably confused at what the fuck I was doing. Yeah. So I received the swing arm looks great, you know, nice, but I bolted up the shocks are super flat angle. It looked like it had a 11 inch shock on this bike yeah. with 14s. So, um, I just, you know, I cut the, the mounts off for the shocks, rewell those further forward and then get the rear wheel in there. And the, you can't adjust the rear wheel all the way forward on the axle adjuster. It was hitting the cross piece. Mm. So, um, kind of had the swing arm as is for a while. And then later, later in the build, I decided to fix that. So I cut the swing arm all apart and just redid it. <laughs> so, um, so I get through the swing arm, the struts, I literally whacked them off with my bandsaw and made a cardboard little template. Yeah. And, uh, my dad's a retired machinist has a CNC at home. And so I went over there with a cardboard template with my factory struts that I cut off. I'm like, Hey, this is what I want to build. Help me draw this on the computer. Uh -huh. And so it helps me and we go through a little, you know, a couple versions. Um, he's like, all right, they're going to be about, you know, about three quarters of a pound each. I'm like, cool. The stock one's like seven pounds. Mm. So that saved a ton of weight. Yeah, that's a solid piece of steel. It is in solid. The yeah. So we actually came up with a little L bracket that welds to the frame where I cut off and it's kind of dovetailed. And so the, the strut actually fits over this, mm. um, over this steel plate and it fits in really tight and then just bolts together. Okay. But yeah. I had to make a jig to get those things to sit perfect and parallel and stuff like that. But, um, so that was early on and then I get the thing into a roller I'm starting playing around with risers and bar set up and kind of sitting on it. And I'm like, you know, I knew I was going to do 17s. So I designed these wheels, had Jade affiliated cut them. Mm. Um, they kind of look like Hoffman's a yeah. little bit, but a little different. Um, I just wanted a simple split five spoke yeah. with uh, kind of the angled cross piece to match like the track dynamics okay. um, yeah. and the struts that we did. So after that, I'm looking at it it was 17s on the bike. I got it into a roller, um, suspension, uh, drew from diamond lane cycles was probably my favorite guy to deal with in this build process. He was just the best customer service and yeah. super helpful. Kind of, he's become a good friend of mine. So he, he helps me out with the suspension. And then I'm looking at this roller. I'm like, this front end is, looks like it's a raked out chopper. Yeah. So that's when I decided to derake the frame. Mm. So, and, what was the, uh, you know, was that more for looks or was it also for some kind of? Nope. Yeah. No, there's a lot that went into that. So uh, the geometry became kind of like a, a hard on for me on this mm -hmm. bike. So with the pivot in the rear end, taking care of the dyna wobble, I wanted the front end to be a lot more nimble and less sloppy. So I go back to my Yamaha R1 2005. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was about 24 and a quarter degrees of rake, but the biggest thing is it had a four and an eighth inch trail. And so I love the way that front end felt. So mm -hmm. I was like, I need to make the front end like my R1. So first step is you got to figure out what trail you want. Then you got to figure out triple clamps because that's going to determine a lot. So Speed Merchant had the best option for me yeah. as far as their offset to generate this trail amount. So I get the triple clamp or the triple clamps in, um, which they have like an inch and a quarter offset. Yeah. And then from then I can calculate what rake I need to go to create that trail that I need. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I brought it down to a little under 25 degrees. Yeah. That seems like a lot. I yeah. Mean, well, it is a lot. Like stock like 29 or 27. 29 was a stock frame, but then the FX DLS had like, I think a one degree rake within the tree. Okay. So it was a, it actually measured the stock bike measured 30 and a half degrees. So, you know, for everybody listening, um, what does a, like that setup kind of provide as far as, uh, you know, how the bike feels like, how does that help the handling? So the, the, the most common, you know, analogy that you'll hear is a shopping cart. 
shopping cart, you know, has zero degree rake. Mm -hmm. Those things turn on a dime. Yeah. And then take a stretched out chopper. Those things are going to be, you know, huge turning radius. They'll be kind of lazy. Yeah. And so the steeper you make your fork angle, basically the more nimble it's going to be. Um, what you give up by doing that is stability and high speed. Yeah. So, um, I think anybody who's ridden a sport bike and ridden a Harley or specifically a Dyna can, you know, correlate the differences between, you know, how the front end feels. The, the, the Dyna was designed to be a cruiser. Yeah. 75, 80 miles an hour. Yeah. You know. And so I think every single Dyna should be set up more of like a FXDX, a 28 degree neck. Yeah. You know, that would be a closer ballpark with a trail. Okay. So, um, well, it's crazy that you'd have a sport bike that's got such a small thing, but it still handles so well at high speed. So I yeah, think that's I maybe mean, every sport bike he's, they come stock with steering stabilizers. Yeah, true. So that is true. Yeah, that was another thing is I um, had to have a steering stabilizer on it. But uh, going down to Born Free, that's literally when I was shaking down the bike, mm -hmm. and um, you know, get a get a couple beers in me and I was like, you know what, let's see what a hundred miles an hour feels like with the steering stabilizer <laughs> off. Yeah. And I'm like, shit, this thing rides great. Hey, you don't even need it. Mm. So I've had, you know, I've had the thing pegged in six. I don't know how, what the speedo is with the new gearing, but yeah, 130, 140, whatever. And one hand on the bars, it, it rides completely nice. straight. That's really good. There's no wobble. Yeah, um, man, you, you basically built <laughs> like the, the Roland Sands just built the new FXR that we for all Buell. want for Buell and you built the Dyna that we all needed. <laughs> so. Yeah, I actually, so he's, um, we got the one moto show coming up in April. I don't know if they've, they're they going to choose my bike, but I really hope Roland's going to be there with that bike. I'd love yeah. to see it. I got, I'm, I'm waiting on a message back. I'm supposed to, we're supposed to make a podcast happen on this trip. But yeah, I, I haven't. You know, there's right now all the people down in, in LA, I got some pretty big names that I've, I've tried to corner into this and uh, there's just a lot of waiting on schedules and shit like that for this. Cause I, I'm on a strict schedule. I'm there. I can't just like, you know, if I'm on the West side of LA, then I, I need to do a podcast on this day only. Like I don't want to go from fucking like the Valley, you know, Simi Valley area and then go all the way to Temecula and then turn around and come all the way back to there the next day or that same day to do a podcast just it's just not feasible so yeah. i have a a very small window of areas i'm going to be that i have to try to make things happen yeah so yeah i'm hoping it does because that bike is hot and uh i've rolling sands you know for me growing up in sport bikes i always loved his take on some of the uh you know mid 2000s um bikes that he built like the no regrets bike the the Kenny, uh, fuck, what was the guy's last name? Kenny Roberts. Kenny Roberts bike was yep. one of my favorite ones. Um, he just built a lot of really cool looking bikes that looked fun to ride. Yeah. You know, I, I have really, really liking a lot of the stuff he's done. Um, you know, some of them, some of them are probably not very practical. Like I think yeah. he did a, uh, he did like a, uh, a street tracker out of a Panigale, which yeah. is like, like that thing in stock form would be scary as fuck. Um, but then you make a street tracker out of her, a dirt tracker. And it's just like, yeah, yeah. But no, super talented guy, really unique ideas. Um, have you ever, you ever heard of Max Hazen? Yeah. Uh, Justin, my machinist was telling me about him. Dude, he's, uh, he's an artist. So I'm probably going to see if I can reach out to him. I, sometimes I hate though, if I don't know much about them, then I feel like I, I won't do the podcast justice because yeah. I won't write the, ask the right questions. Um, and that's a lot of times that is kind of like the hesitation, you know, yeah. cause you know, sometimes you don't want to, uh, for as far as in my, you know, where I'm at with it, like you want the podcast to happen when it's supposed to happen. Cause sometimes I feel like I'm not prepared. I might, you know, if I would have had the opportunity to have one, like some big name, like, you know, Jesse James or, or Roland Sands on the podcast in the first like 50 episodes, I'm not that good at this yet. You know what I mean? And I'm still not that great now. You're pretty dialed. You gave yourself more credit. Yeah. But then, you know, you want to get to that point where you can, uh, you can do it justice and not waste an opportunity. I mean, you can't like you're interviewing people that probably have never sat down and done this before. Like you're only as good as your weakest link. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
I, I think, you know, I've listened to a lot of your stuff and I think you're really good. I like the structure. I like how, you know, there's typically a backstory with people. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed, you know, a lot of your podcasts, but, um, you know, some people it's just their personality. Yeah. You, like yeah. you could go interview Jesse James. He could be having a bad day. He could be going through some shit and it's be, it might be dull. Yeah. Yeah. And then what's that going to do for you? Yeah. Same. I mean, there's always that, a uh, you know, that, uh, that factor in the mix. Um, but yeah, you know, there's, you know, I, I, I try to, I really literally my whole, you know, concept of everything is just through Rogan. You know, Rogan has the ability to have a scientist on and be serious and, and do this. He has the ability to talk about, you know, issues. Then he has the ability to do mushrooms and get fucked up with his buddies and yeah. have a good time. And I, you know, I always tell people, you know, cause of course most people enjoy the backstory podcast. Yeah. But once you do the backstory podcast, you still got to have another podcast at some point. Yeah. Like, you know, with you, it's like, okay, well, this is getting a lot of backstory and backstory on this build. Well, well when you come back on again, like, what are we going to talk about now? So now we have to start looking at yeah. all these other areas of, of concept. And now that, you know, we're at 300 plus episodes. Yeah. Our motorcycle industry is not that big. It's not. So um, we need, we need more people to keep pushing the envelope. And I, yeah. I don't want to toot my own horn saying that I did something for this scene, mm. but I really think that there's a lot of talented guys out there that, you know, maybe a bike like mine can inspire them to push the envelope more than just bolting on yeah. parts. Yeah. hundred percent. It sucks because, you know, we have the handbuilt show coming up in April and that's the kind of bikes that the handbuilt show usually does. Yeah. You know, and, that's in Austin, Texas. And then, so like, this isn't your, your main gig. This isn't what you do for a living. So no, it's like, I, I work 80, 90 hour weeks. Yeah. Uh, you know, you need an electrician. I build data centers for work. Yeah. I'm building a, a five building complex for Facebook right now. <laughs> and I'm doing swing shift. I'm going to work tonight. Yeah. It's, I, you know, it's a, it's a feast or famine in the construction industry. And fortunately I'm at the, in the leadership role mm -hmm. being pretty young. It's nice, but, uh, I, I have some downtime and I pretty much plan out the work. I make sure the guys have the information materials. Um, I do a lot of quality control. You know, we're doing a lot of the main power into the building, huge wire, like wire that big around. Damn. And it's, you know, it's super physically challenging to do some of this work, but um, my position affords me to spend time, you know, thinking about my hobbies. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. and then it, it, it you know allows me to afford it too yeah. <laughs> um you know i i'm fortunate that i live in an area where work is so heavy that yeah, i can abundant. you know make this kind of dough to dump it into a fucking stupid bike <laughs> <laughs> but um no i've got um i've got some ideas floating in my head i just obviously i just had my second kid mm -hmm. he's a fresh little boy and i need to i, I want to be there for my children that's yeah, number yeah. one for me um, the bikes will be on a little back burner, but I am going to do a road glide for nice. to ride. And then my next build that will be of this caliber, um, I'm going to do a M8 swap Dyna. Okay. I'm going to make it an FX DX, you know, bike that came with an M8 with the swing arm pivot through the frame. And I want that to be my fun rider. Mm. This thing was supposed to be a fun rider. It's, uh, it's scary. Like that bike, I mean, it's, it's really nice. I put two years of time into it and it's, it was supposed to be a bike that I was going to go take out to the track and abuse and it, maybe it will be someday, but for now it's, you know, it's kind of evolved into something like, I don't know what to do with it. You could build a big stage platform over there and just kind of hang it on the wall. I, I could, see but it, you, you know? know, it's, um, you know, yesterday I fired it up and took it on a couple mile. Yeah. rip around town i'm like holy shit this thing's fun and, but the problem is is the way it handles and rides is so so well that like you don't i have never i have not found the limits of it i don't know how far to push it mm -hmm. um you know granted the tires are amazing the yeah. lop q4s so it's like a basically a race a track tire that you don't really need warmers for yeah um we don't have the climate right now for to get these tires warmed up but when it's warm out, like I'll be able to toss this in the corner. It's just like a sport bike. Mm. So this summer, you know, now that I have, you know, one little, little chip on the paint, I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's yeah. just have some fun with it. <laughs> but, uh, no, I'm, I'll do a, I'll do another Dyna. 
I want to make something, you know, 19 inch wheels, something a little bit more civilized, I guess. Yeah. But I really want to do an M8 swap in it. That'd be unique, man. Yeah. You know, M8 swap the world is what's going on right now. It's a great motor. You know it what is. I mean? It's just the power you can make and yeah, they're super easy. smooth. Hey guys, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about our Patreon. By signing up, you will be supporting the podcast and gaining access to unreleased episodes, series, and be able to catch our live YouTube podcast. Also, for the foreseeable future, if you sign up under one of our tiers, you will be eligible to win a Simpson motorcycle helmet each month. Hope to see you guys there. Now let's get back to the pod. What about, uh, so what are you thinking about with the Rogue Glide? Uh, just for two up purposes. Oh, just to be able to yeah, jump on the bike. Yeah, just like a really balanced bike. Of, um, I've ridden a handful of them and you sit on them. They just, they feel great. Mm-hmm. It would, I would lo- love to get into what you do and like actually put miles on versus just hot laps around, you know, the yeah. twisty roads around here. Like yeah, I would, yeah. I, w- I think I would really enjoy, you know, going state to state on a bike, which I've never really done. Yeah. That's kind of one of the things that's going on right now. There's a, you know, maybe this ties into some of the, what you're talking about, but a lot of the motorcycle people online and going to Daytona and all this, it's like they, you know, the performance baggers air quotes are literally something that could be a lot of different things. It could be a track bike. It could be a show bike on the, on the road. And it could be something that you just enjoy long distance trips on. Right. Yeah. And it's a modular thing like many bikes are, but you know, I think it's cool. It's a good like place to be because every time you add something new to it, it makes it better. You know what I mean? Yeah. You put better brakes on there. It makes the the ride better. You put better suspension, you get your bar and your seat, your triangle set up really well. You have a better riding position. You can ride further. And you know, some people, you know, can do the rotors, but they can't do the calipers. You know, that's literally, you can have $5,000 in brakes really quickly. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. (laughs) And, but it's, it's just a weird place where you have so many, you know, people that are like, they, you know, oh man, that's not a performance bagger. It's got custom paint on it. I'm like, well, isn't, isn't motorsports, motorcycle supposed to look cool? Yeah. You know, like what's cool about a black bike? It's just, it's just a black bike. It I is. mean, I'm not saying it doesn't look cool, but when everybody has a black bike, then, you know, like. Don't you want it to represent you more? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think the performance bagger thing has, it's, it's, I'm having a hard time like jumping on board with the guys that are like, Oh, I got this super performance bagger. I'm like, no, you got a 850 pound pig. (laughs) Yeah. You put some bling on it and you, you know, through the Olin shocks on it, whatever. But like, you know, there's a guy out there that can take a clapped out, you know, nineties, bagger and outride you on fucking shitty tires yeah so like what is performance yeah it's 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 the wrong term for this bike is what it is but it's the term we got yeah yeah (laughs) no i i think they look awesome yeah i would love a road glide st you know pretty basic bars um you know suspension pipe and just ride it because it's, it's a great platform. It is. And, you know, when you think about it, like, you know, yes, the word performance has real undertones of reality of like what it really means, right? Like your bike, like the bikes that run around the tracks for BRL and uh, King of the Baggers. But, I mean, club style baggers, I mean, I guess that could have been one of the, the ways to put it, but this wasn't something that really diverged from the club scene. Yeah. You know, the way that the Dyna and the FXR had a look, right? Yeah. So that, that doesn't really apply, but it's definitely different than all the other baggers that, that was of the mid two thousands and then the big wheel shit. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. What do you, T bar baggers? I mean, like nothing really fit the mold yeah. properly, but is it the level of performance that, that comes on sport bikes or like once again, your bike? No, but, the concept is it's pushing towards that envelope. Yeah. So it would fall into that performance category more than it's going to fall into a big wheel bagger. Yeah. You know, those are just stupid. Exactly. Dumb. Yeah. I mean, granted, like I, 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 I made a lot of money in that world and I rode those bikes a lot I'm and sure I enjoyed if you were it. like immersed in the scene and like, yeah. you, you know, you had your like, your retired buddies that had a lot of money <laughs> and you wanted to look cool in Daytona. Cool. But, yeah. um, you know, like it looks just like, a butchered, you know, it does. Toy. But at the time, like when it came out, when it was going, when it was going really strong, 
and it was new, it was new. You know what I mean? Yeah. Motorcycling for the other half of the country that doesn't have this kind of riding was meant something differently. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, you know, and it's also why like perform just the whole performance bagger thing is so much more predominant when you, they, the West coast does not believe me because they don't ever leave the West coast. Yeah. But there's way more performance baggers on the other side of the Rockies. I, I would imagine, you know, cause I mean, I've been to born free. I've seen what's in the parking lot. It's not performance baggers. Yeah. It's fucking Vicla's and everybody's on that fucking, you know, what is it? Mayans kick and all that shit. So, yeah. um, but baggers have always really been big on that side of the country anyway. So it was an easy transition for everybody. Cause they're already used to riding baggers went out here, you know, you got fucking, you got twisties, you got lane splitting, you got all these things that kind of push you into a more narrow bike. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, especially when you get down to California, a lot more people commuting on bikes, a lot more sport bikes. There's definitely more sport bikes out here than I think most other places. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's just, there's just so much that goes into the, to the ecosphere of motorcycle trends and how they kind of, uh, blanket the country in different eras. You yeah. know what I'm saying? You know, it would be interesting to see if, if Instagram didn't exist, what yeah. would the scene really be like? It would take a lot longer for it to make its way. Like, cause you, you were, were you into Harley's, were you into the big wheel thing when Instagram kind of came out or? Yeah, I was, okay. it was before that. Cause Instagram came out in 2012 ish. Uh, I think I finally, yeah, 2000, it came out officially, I think in 11. Yeah. There's like betas and stuff before that, but the real, like the Instagram we know now, or we used to know, uh, came out like I think in 11 and then it really, I know that I got on in 2012. Yeah. Um, but before that, and this is the one thing that I think a lot of people forget, is I was on Facebook, I was on MySpace, uh, I was on those things, but those were on computers. It wasn't on your phone. Yeah. And so, like, you'd go home and log into MySpace and sit there on a computer and you scan your photo in on a scanner. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was different. And then when the iPhone came out and things became apps, then all these companies started putting you know, the work to create a Facebook app, you know what I mean? And Facebook was the first social media app, I think, along with Twitter, yeah. I believe. Um, but they evolved it. So it was just different then, you know what I mean? And then, like I said, so uh, Instagram just, it made things be able to fast track, right? But if as much as it'll fast track the rest of the country seeing a, a style and a trend, it can also kill the thing. It's just as fast. I, I, th I think that's the problem is, you know, Instagram, they have all the algorithms. Granted, it's probably going to showcase the more liked things out there. Yeah, for sure. And uh, you see a lot of bikes out there. And, and th this is the bummer with, you know, say for like a nice paint job that you do. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be played in a matter of days, right? On yeah. the internet. Because it's, it's going to be in your face constantly. Yep. And uh, that's... That's the bummer. You know, I think that's why a lot of guys probably build a bike and get rid of it the next year. They yeah, I mean, that's why, I, that's why I like, you know, coming up here, I sold the paint job that was on my last bagger. Because with all the travels I do, I need the content to be fresh. Yeah. And I don't want to just sand over a fucking paint job that's perfectly good. So might yeah. as well. And there's no unique parts on my bike. It's all factory stuff. You but know? you know what you could do with it is, I mean, it takes a lot of time and energy, but doing the video work. Yeah. You know, like you see, see the cinematography videos on YouTube of cars, like where they have like really cool, like drone shots and stuff. And that's like the that. plan. And yeah. that I think is the next step in social media is, is putting in the work and getting the videos because pictures. Yeah. Yeah. You know, anybody can take a picture. Yeah. That's the thing is like, you know, anybody can, but I, you know, I had all these bikes that just went to Daytona that I painted and I swear to God, I couldn't get a good picture from anybody because yeah there is a difference between real photography and what's in your, in your, in your pocket, you know, when you see it, when you, but the problem is this is why it becomes hard with pictures is because everybody looks at pictures on the same device. Yeah. Right. They don't see it. Like when I take a picture and I, and I'm on my laptop or on my big screen computer at the house, that's a different experience. Yeah. Then, you know, your five, four inch screen phone or seven inch screen With, phone, right? You know, very little, you know, resolution. That's exactly. The, and that goes back to my Instagram. My Levita Smoto page is I barely have any content on it mm -hmm. because I am so critical of what I post. Exactly. And I'm like, how, I, I don't have one, I got one picture in my driveway. 
of my bike of the sun hitting it, the carbon kind of popping. And I did one reel that kind of, mm-hmm. I mean, did it with my phone, but like it, it yeah. kind of showed a lot of detail, but there was not a whole ton of content of my build because I'm like, I, I'm not happy with this or I don't like the lighting. And I really, well, I don't have the lighting in this shop is not great. Mm-hmm. Um, it's probably 5,000 Kelvin lights, which kind of gives off a blue hue, it, you know, creates yeah. some odd tones in the, in the, the gray on the paint job here. Yeah. It kind of looks like a blue. Yeah. It does. Bring it out in the sun. It looks way better. Well, but, yeah, that's, I mean, there's just so many things to that. Right. But I mean, after we get this podcast done, I'm going to shoot the bike and I'm going to send it to Jordan from hot bike for, a potential fe- feature he hasn't s- said yes or no yeah but i'd rather have the content so that you know because with hot bike coming back into print yeah. he's asked me to shoot some other things so i'm like well i'm gonna show you some cool shit you might not know about what's who's the guy who runs jeff holt between yeah, visionary. visionary he actually reached out to me uh, a few months ago i think he was putting together a book and he's like yeah. hey dude can you like can you get some real shots of your bike and i reached out to a couple buddies that you know were pretty good photographers locally they busy couldn't do it we didn't have great weather it just never happened but um you know it's kind of that's kind of why i like this bike is it has i mean you know my instagram's blown up a lot since i had like 100 followers on that page and you know i think my bike has been talked about within a small group of this scene but um i think most people haven't seen it or know anything about it or if they see it like oh cool you know it looks like a little different, you know, why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? And then you, you look at it in person and it's, it's pretty nuts. Like yeah. it's, it's still a Dyna, but it, there's a lot of aspects that are completely custom and unique to yeah. the world. Um, but I, I'm waiting until I can get some good content. I'd love to get some good video shots. Yeah. This exhaust sounds insane. I've never heard a Harley sound like this. Mm. And, uh, I'd love to get some good content out there for the guys that yeah. I'm sure a lot of people are like, when's this guy going to post some good <laughs> shit? I'm like, well, I work a ton. Uh, I've got a family and I have just an iPhone. So sorry yeah. guys. It's tough, man. But you know, with ever with that being said, it's like, you know, I had all these bikes go to Daytona. I, all I wanted to do was make posts on it. And all I could get were like, you know, bless their heart. They were trying their best. Right. But you know, they go on the beach and then, you know, the sun's too much that they have to do it at the right time of day. And, you know, they don't have thousands of dollars of equipment to kind of control the lighting and things like that. So there's just a lot that goes into it. But when you see it in real life, when you hold a picture, when you see the difference between a phone and, and, uh, and, and actual photography, like you'll notice it. You just don't, people don't pay attention to it because even when I take a, a huge file photo and I shove it into Instagram, it compresses it down and makes it look way shittier than it actually does. Yeah. But still looks better than an iPhone. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? You can zoom in on your pictures on your page and you're like, Oh, I can see some detail and you look at mine and it gets really grainy. It's just an iPhone image is very, very like flattened. Yeah. But it uses contrast to kind of create this illusion of depth. When a camera though, has depth to it so you see more it 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 just play like an iphone when you put it on portrait mode that's digitally making it look like it has some kind of depth like with the bokeh is what they call it um but a real camera it that's in the lens that happens so it's just different man yeah don't get me wrong iphone content's great for a lot you know I, i think that you could do a youtube channel with an iphone and be completely fine i think it's amazing for like if you're a pet person or if you have yeah. kids you know yeah. like how easy it is it to like snap your phone out and take a picture of your kid you know walking for the first time like we have a video of my daughter harley taking her first four steps and mm. we were able to get it on camera nice and I, know, I have a picture i have a video of my son taking his first steps it's yeah. still on my phone that's pretty cool yeah and, and then, he's 13 uh, he's with 13 next month so you like, go you know. back to like you know when i was younger when it was you know cameras where you had to print the shit out you know to see even see it i got a uh, film camera too out there do you yeah for this trip because I, I, I actually have a uh my mom uh framed me this thing so when i was like finished eighth grade my mom's like i'll take you anywhere you want to go whatever you want to do for a, a trip for you know finishing eighth grade what do you do so i told her i want to go down to long beach i want to meet jesse james Mm. And so I was, you know, what was that? 
12 years old, 13 or whatever. So my mom books a flight down to LA. If we go down to LA, get a rental car, drive down to Long Beach. I would think it was like a Thursday or Friday. Show up at West Coast, West Coast Choppers. And um, right when I walked in that shop, he had like a little upstairs mezzanine with his yeah. offices. And I seen Jesse. And then this annoying broad came down. She's like, can I help you? Like to my mom, who's like Miss Corporate, you know, lady yeah. and her little little boy wearing a fox racing hoodie. Yeah. Like, can I help you? And and she's like, oh, my son would love to meet Jesse James and maybe see some bikes. And she's like, he's not here. And I'm like, oh, I just seen him up there. And okay, give me a minute. And he comes down. And my mom is like is anything but a motorcycle chick, you know, yeah. just, you know, had a corporate job, very professional. And she brings her little kid who's, you know, likes yeah. BMX bikes and stuff. And uh, I was a fan of Jesse James before um, uh, those discovery shows came on for real, just from magazines and stuff. Mm. I liked his style and whatnot. So Jesse came down, showed me around a shop for like an hour. Nice. Um, took some pictures with him. I got one of those original gasoline West coast choppers jackets Hell yeah. still. Um, he only had an XL. So it, now it's like it pretty much fits me now. <laughs> so, but him showing me around the shop, he was super humble. Um, that, that is my huge, biggest inspiration to why I do what I do. That is. Yeah. So, um, I know he's gone through a lot of shit through the media and his endless women, but I, <laughs> I look at his skills and what he's done to progress this industry. And yeah, that's my biggest inspiration is him. Yeah, same, you know, uh, I've said it a million times on here, you know, watching those old, you know, you know, monster garage more than anything was more my inspiration. Uh, then, you know, the motorcycle mania, cause that kind of came afterwards, but, or I mean the motorcycle mania for me came afterwards, even though I think it came before yeah. the monster garage, but yeah, that's rad. So you got to, yeah, you know, I was, I mean, it was pretty young. Like I, I have, I have the frame thing upstairs. I'll show you in a little bit later, but, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty cool. It was pretty eye opening to see like what you could create, you know, cause when, when, we were younger, I guess I'm what you're 40. I'm 40. Yeah. So I'm turning 35 here next week, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, when we were younger, it was college was the big push, mm -hmm. you know, high school was like, go to college, go to college, go to college. And to, to be in my position now where I didn't go to college, I got into the trades and to see I'm doing far better than people with degrees. Like, yeah, it's pretty cool. And Jesse James was kind of an inspiration to that. You, like you, you can work hard, you can get good at your craft and you can actually do something with your life. And yeah, I mean, he's always pushed that. And I think that even myself, you know, in that time frame, was, was like inspired by that because I was in a trade, you know what I mean? Yeah. Paint and body and stuff. So yeah, dude, it, uh, that's, that's something that I think that a lot of people just don't think about like how much more, his uh his the things that he's done and and kind of pushed and and shown the world has made you know careers yeah you know? i mean honestly and like to the listeners out there um i think what i'm excited to be on this podcast is because i feel like a lot of the guys you interview are in the industry like mm -hmm. they have a business they've been established and um i fortunately kind of created something that put me on the map, I guess, mm -hmm. but I am not in the industry. This is yeah. just a hobby for me. And I kind of went from nothing to up there as far as a build quality goes yeah. and anybody can do it. Like I, you know, I'm just your basic hobbyist that yeah. had an angle grinder and a, a welder. And then I just kind of progressed from that. And, you know, it did take a lot of hard work and a lot of hours to buy s some of the tools I have, but, yeah. um, you know, I didn't have any special training. I didn't have, I mean, this whole trip abnormal, this whole trip, it's, it's been a balance of that. I've had guys on that are at the beginning of their career in motorcycling, but they've already kind of, uh, you know, ridden a lot or done cool shit. And I've got people that are on their 20th year. You know what I mean? And I think it's uh, I think it's good to, to make the barrier of entry of all this stuff, just simply doing cool shit, making cool shit, you know, regardless of what, it, whether or not they're a brand or a business or not, it's like, it's what's going to resonate with the listener and maybe create some inspiration for it. Yeah. Right. Uh, or motivation either. 
And that's one thing that, you know, you know, kind of taking it back to the social media shit. That's one thing I miss about social media is everything feels like, like you're being sold something. Everybody is naturally, and I'm, I'm guilty of this. You're naturally trying to do something on there. Like you're not posting for any other reason other than I want something back. I want yeah. another follower. I want to be bigger. I want, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, or, you know, e- even if it's something more, you know, humble, like I want to inspire someone, you know yeah. what I mean? That's kind of like my page. I don't, um, granted like my header is like, Oh, I build custom parts and exhaust. Like I've had so many people, hundreds of people message me like, Hey, how much is exhaust for this? How much is that? And like, okay, well I live in Oregon. You're in, you know, Alabama. Yeah. Um, I don't have a jig for this pipe. So I kind of build stuff on the bike and yeah. it's kind of select, you know, select only. And, yeah. uh, I, uh, I don't really, I'm not trying to get anything out of it. I'm simply proud of what I've done mm-hmm. and I want to kind of show yeah. what I'm capable of. And I have a lot to learn and I'm nowhere near, you know, as good as others, but, uh, yeah, I'm proud of what I've done and that's all my page really is. And then I've like to, you know, build stuff here and there for people. I'd yeah. like to see my, my work on someone's bike. What's well, cool that you're, you know, like what you've done on this and what you even mentioned earlier about the, uh, the Dyna M8, it's like you want to take something that doesn't exist and make it exist. Yeah. You know, and that's the kind of shit that people need to see because, you know, it's like the first guy that did an M8 and FXR. It's like, damn, now the, now everybody's trying to do it. Yeah. It's harder than a twin cam, but at the same time, it's like more people, you know, go down that, that path, you know, yeah, but how hard is it to cut a trigger, uh, pull a trigger on a bandsaw? Exactly. Anybody can do it. Mm-hmm. It's, can you, can you see the process through? Can yeah. you like envision, okay, how are we going to manipulate the frame to, you know, wrap around this different engine or whatever? Yeah. It's like, it's, it's acquired just, knowledge basically. Yeah. But you know. anybody can do it. You just have to gotta have the balls. Yeah. I mean, you gotta have a lot of balls to cut up a perfectly good bike. Man. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, we, we it's only, easier to do it on an FXR because you know, you're starting with a frame, you yeah. know, like something that, you know, like you started with a fifteen thousand eight hundred dollar bike versus, you know, you could pick up an FXR almost anywhere in the country. Maybe not the West Coast, but for three grand. Yeah, you know, that's if you whoops it, it's yeah, still like, whatever. you know, it's three grand. You know, which don't don't be wrong, three grand is a lot of money to me. But you know, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, what do you think about uh? So, on the bike, you know, we kind of talked about the 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 D rake, the the stuff you did in the back as far as the um the swing arm and all that stuff. What do you think was the most challenging thing on the whole build for you? Um, probably the waiting game on parts. I think a lot of people <laughs> waiting in the on last parts, couple of years can yeah. relate to that. Um, I think, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of hours I've spent in the shop sitting on this stool, staring at something and like, yeah. how can I figure this out? The mid controls were, that was, a long, that was probably a month of just staring, you know, holding foot pegs up and like, okay, what can I do here? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, I think the second I got the rolling chassis with the D rake and the swing arm in it, I had a vision. Mm. And from there I was like, you know, when I approached you for paint, I'm like, you did a helmet that was like carbon. Yeah. And I kind of like, Hey, I, I like this style. And I gave you whatever freedom I wanted. I just like, incorporate you know yeah. the turn gold leaf um here's a, a gray powder coat sample i'm going to use and do it do your thing yeah but i don't really think any particular part was the most challenging i think the exhaust was very tedious but mm-hmm. with what i've done with stainless exhaust like that was uh it was honestly fine it wasn't yeah. too bad it was just uh the hardest thing was i didn't sleep for three months finishing the bike up <laughs> But, uh, no, I think, I don't know, staring at it. Um, I don't know. I, yeah. I, I think, uh, I think it all kind of came together with, uh, with, you know, over a period of almost two years, mm. like you got enough time to think and process things, but, uh, the weight savings was huge. That was a huge factor. So, um, what's it? Five oh yeah. Months? We didn't even talk about yeah, that. That's a, so, to the listeners out there, the bike weighs 538 pounds of the full tank of gas. Mm. Um, my bike before I cut into it was 679 with probably a half tank. Mm-hmm. So is it 
sizable weight loss. Yeah. Um, I could lose more weight going to a carbon wheel, but if you if you were to track it, they don't allow yeah, composite you, wheels on the track. You yeah exactly. So you and you also have what probably three pounds in that seat, so you can be in a good racing position. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, we added some foam there. What um, your friend was like, uh, he had to convince you to put gel in there. <laughs> Cause yeah, no, the- there, there's there, there's actually no gel in it. It's just more foam. Oh, more foam. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, you got to make it rideable. And then yeah. like with the feet being further back and higher up, you needed to have your butt up higher. But I didn't like the looks of, you know, the, the race bikes with the seats that are a foot tall. Mm. So this is a happy medium. Yeah, um, it's yeah. still a fairly comfortable riding position. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I think it turned out good. Um, there isn't really anything I would change. Mm, that's good. That's, that's hard for anybody to say when they finish yeah, the bike. You I, know? uh, I think the, the kickstand could have been improved to the point where it's, uh, cause right now it's a prop rod. Mm-hmm. I literally have to pull it off these holders on the front down tube of the frame and then stick it in this little machine block. So it's like, you can't just hop on it and kick the thing over and, yeah, away go. you go you got to kind of fiddle fart and balance the bike and but other than that whatever and it's it's cool. pretty damn rideable besides that that's it looks good dude i'm actually i'm excited to shoot it man so i guess we can ri- wrap that up here dude we yeah. did you know i'm kind of on these trips i'm kind of keeping them a little short than the four hour podcast on yeah drinking but well i mean this this opens up the door for round two yeah exactly I'll, uh i mean here and probably midsummer i'm going to be knee deep into another project and it's it's only going up from here nice nice well tell you know tell them where to find you um wait you got to tell them the reason the name what's it mean okay so levitas moto and if you are uh if you're like greek or whatever from europe you might pronounce it different and maybe i'm or latin i might be pronouncing it wrong it might be levitas or whatever so I uh, started building exhaust for guys and started getting the, the, you know, the little scene of doing work for other people. And I'm like, I need to make, I need to have a name, right? Mostly for Instagram. And uh, my sister was a classical studies major and she knew a lot of Latin and Greek words. Mm -hmm. So I told her, I'm like, Hey, is there a a, a Latin word for like lightweight speed, you know, fast or whatever? And she's like, yeah, Levitas. I was like, Sounds good. <laughs> Run it. So Levitas Moto, um, Levitas underscore Moto on Instagram. My name's Michael. I'm uh, just your average blue collar Joe, just uh, <laughs> with a few tools and a couple wild ideas. Hell yeah. Well, so, thank you, man. I really appreciate yeah, it. Congratulations appreciate on the baby, man. Yeah, thank you. Young son. <laughs> yep. So you got one of each now. One of each. Uh, might have to call her good after that. Hey, that's what I did, dude. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. So, all right, but I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I really appreciate you listening. And I want to thank Michael again for sitting down and doing the podcast. Had a great time seeing his environment and shooting pictures of that bike. It was really awesome. If you guys haven't checked out already, you know we've been doing a little vlog on YouTube. So if you want to check that out, go to our YouTube and subscribe and uh, help us support that side of the things that we're doing. I don't know. Anyway, I do appreciate you listening. Uh, Check out the vlog. Check out the Patreon. Check out our sponsors. They help make all this stuff happen. And uh, yeah, we got some more stuff coming. I'm going to try to drop three episodes this week. All right. So this is one. We'll see you on the next one.